class. Welcome back to another lecture. This one is lesson seven of nine for this unit. Uh, it's called the gallbladder, pancreas, and villi. Uh, after this lesson, there is a quiz. So after you're done uh, this lesson and the assignment, please let me know. You can check it all off and you can have uh, the quiz to do. After lesson nine, again, there is a test after the entire unit. So let's get going. First we have the gallbladder. Uh, the gallbladder varies in size, shape, and position between different people. And you should be able to see this on the diagram uh, that was given to you for the last unit, and you may have it in your notes as well with this unit, but it is the green oval-shaped uh, organ. Uh, it is located right under the liver, and that is because the liver Makes the, gall, uh, makes the bile that is stored in the uh, gallbladder. So the gallbladder varies in size, shape, and, is, and position between different people. Uh, it stores and releases bile, which emulsifies fat. So note that it doesn't make the bile, it just stores and releases it. The liver is what makes the bile. Uh, so the liver makes the bile and it's stored in the gallbladder and the gallbladder releases it. Now, the Emulsifies is a fancy word for breaks down fat. Because fat likes to stick together, so it likes to break it up. That's what bile does. Bile flows through the small vessels uh, into the cystic duct and then into the bile duct to the duodenum. So the important part here is that it empties into the duodenum through the bile duct. So bile obviously comes through the bile duct. Uh, so here we can see the green part that is the gallbladder and it is emptied into the bile duct, which empties into the duodenum. So this is the beginning of the small intestine. So the, that's why it's so close to the liver, is because the liver makes the bile and the gallbladder stores it and releases it. Um, we're gonna talk about the pancreas soon, uh, but it is also connected to the common bile duct to empty into the duodenum. So it all comes through the same tube. If this tube gets clogged, that's very, very, very bad. Uh, it might require surgery to uh, fix. So that's very important. Gallstones are crystal-like deposits that develop in the gallbladder. So they are look something like this. They're like little stones. Uh, this is obviously in a medical bag, uh, but that can develop in the gallbladder and actually I bet a lot of people have them. Uh, they're very, very common to have. Uh, it's just when they get dislodged that they become a problem. So these are gallstones. So these deposits may be as small as a grain of sand or as large as a golf ball. So that stresses me out. I'm going to read that. Uh, they, may not, they may be hard or soft, smooth or jagged. So they have many, many different um, forms, essentially. You may have several gallstones at once or just one. Uh, gallstones that are simply floating around inside the gallbladder generally cause no symptoms and no harm. Uh, they're very, very common um, and they just float around in your gallbladder and there's nothing that you need to do about them. Um, when symptoms occur, it's because the gallstone has moved and has become lodged within a duct that carries bile. So the cystic duct or the bile duct. So if the gallstone comes out of here and travels down the tube and gets stuck down here. That is a really, really big problem. If it gets stuck in here, that is also a problem, but it's not as big a problem. If it blocks up the pancreas as well, that can be devastating. So it depends where it gets stuck, uh, but that is what causes the problem. So obstructions in the bile pathway may cause a duct to become inflamed and possibly infected caused by too much cholesterol, which comes from a high fat diet, which is kind of ironic because bile is what breaks down fat. So the gallbladder stores bile and releases it into the small intestine, into the duodenum specifically. You can get gallstones, which generally aren't a problem until they um, become lodged in the tube. And that is when, when they become an issue because they clog it. That is the overall um, most important parts for key points one and two, gallbladder and gallstones. Again, gallstones. So key point three here, pancreas. Uh, I notice actually I spelt pancreas wrong in the title below me. Uh, take off the E. Um, it wouldn't be a unit without a couple of spelling mistakes. So uh, if you know me, 
I apologize, but that's the way it goes. Um, so the pancreas produces a base to neutralize acid. So the enzymes that I was talking about in the stomach and uh, small intestine sections um, that need to be neutralized, that all comes from the pancreas. So it, it comes as a base because it needs to neutralize the acid. Uh, proteolytic enzymes, so that means the cutting of proteins. So I'd make a note of that when you write proteolytic. Uh, lytic means cut and proteo is protein. So proteolytic means cutting of proteins. Uh, including trypsin and chymotrypsin are secreted by the pancreas and cleave proteins into smaller peptides. So they help to break down proteins into amino acids, essentially. Um, lipids are degraded into fatty acids and glycerol by pancreatic lipase. So lipids, and then you turn the end into ASC, that is an enzyme, so it would break down lipids, lipase. So lipids, li pancreatic lipase, and bile both help to break down fats so that you can absorb them and then they'll be used in your body. So you don't want to have too much fat in your diet because you will absorb it and then store it. And that is what uh, we often don't want nowadays. So this is what the pancreas looks like. Uh, we have the head, the neck, the body, and the tail. Don't worry too much about um, these, but know that there are four parts, uh, and they're pretty self-explanatory. They go like the same as a body would, head, neck, body, tail, um, away from the uh, small intestine. So it functions as well to regulate your blood sugar levels. So uh, it secretes the hormone insulin and as well as glucagon. So you've probably heard of insulin. Insulin is very important for people with diabetes because they don't, they can't make it themselves. And what insulin does is it allows energy or glucose to be taken up by your cells. So if you can't make it, you might have enough uh, glucose in your blood, but your cells can't use it. So insulin is required to take up that glucose and to use it. Glucagon does the opposite, and we'll get more into that at the later at a later. Um, lecture. But what we want to know for now is that when blood glucose levels are low, the alpha uh, cells secrete glucagon, which increases the blood glucose levels. And when the blood glucose levels are high, beta cells secrete insulin to decrease glucose levels in the blood. So that's a good jumping off point for what we uh, will talk about, I believe, in lesson nine. Um, just knowing that portion right there. So alpha cells secrete glucagon and blood glucose levels go up. So that's energy in your blood. Uh, and then when blood glucose levels are high, beta cells secrete insulin to decrease the energy levels in your blood. So depending on what level you have, you have the hormone there to allow it to reverse itself or to balance out. So we'd also like to remember uh, from previous lectures as well as nutrition that glucose is stored as glycogen in the liver. So um, what happens when the glucose levels are high and we secrete insulin, we take some of that energy into our liver to be stored. Other energy goes into your cells um, to be used. So it can go into multiple different places. It just means that the glucose level will decrease. And that's what you want if you are uh, diabetic and need insulin. You want your blood glucose levels to decrease. So we're gonna jump back into the small intestine, pardon me, just because villi are very, very important. We talked about them a little bit, but we're gonna see some diagrams of them here today. Uh, so almost all the nutrients are absorbed into the bloodstream because of these villi. Villi are finger-like projections that increase the surface area and increase absorption. So you can imagine that you have a tube that is your small intestine, and the villi will line the inside of the tube all the way along, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And what that does is each projection increases how much surface area there is. It increases how much liquid is able to be touched by uh, the small intestine. And what will that will do is it will increase absorption. So maybe I should have highlighted that, but that is important. The villi increase absorption. And each villi 
has a micro villi on it. So they're microscopic projections on the villi that increase the surface area and increase absorption by 600 times. So you have the small intestine, like a tube, and it's covered in villi, and each of those finger-like projections are covered in villi. So the idea is just to get as much surface area as possible to absorb as much nutrients as you can because there's only so much space in your stomach. There's only so much space for you to have uh, so much um, small intestine. If possible, it would be good to have a longer intestine. You get more absorption. You have more efficient food intake, uh, but we only have so much space. So fats are absorbed through the lymph vessels and we'll see a little diagram here, yes. So this is this would be the wall of the intestine, uh, and this would be the villi. And all of these things are being absorbed into the villi. Uh, the fatty acids go into the lymph vessel. Uh, just know that all of these things are absorbed into the villi. Now, we also have microvilli, as you can see in this diagram here. Each of these villi and each of these cells have little tiny, tiny villi on them that increase the surface area. So the whole idea, because nutrients are so, so, so small, the idea is to increase surface area so you can absorb things into each and every one of these instead of only, this. And like you can imagine this is like five for each of these and there's so many along the edge instead of just this one, you've got 600 times more surface area. So this is a villi, and then these tiny, tiny things are the microvilli, and they're very, very important. What we'd like you to do now is to sum up uh, this whole last section. I'd like you to follow the journey of a cheeseburger as it gets digested from the mouth to the small intestines. So the bun would have carbohydrates, the meat patty would have proteins, fats, and minerals, the lettuce would have cellulose and vitamins. The cheese would have lactose and fat. Chipotle mayo, yum, would have proteins and fat. And bacon has proteins, fats, and minerals. And we've talked about throughout each lesson where each of these is broken down and where they're absorbed. Uh, some of them, one or two of them, might be um, a little bit unknown. You'll have to do a little bit of research for that, but that's okay. Uh, and if you have questions, please let me know. But we should be able to do these. We should be able to break these down. Uh, the cheese gets broken down in the stomach by uh, lactase. The fat in the cheese gets broken down by bile and pancreatic uh, lipase in the small intestine. Specifically, the duodenum. The more specific you can get, the better. And the more, uh, the more prepared you'll be for the quiz. So the questions will be what it gets digested at each step uh, and you must have a complete list for each organ that we've talked about in the digestive system um, it should be a complete explanation of what gets broken down where when you're done that and I've checked it all out you'll be able to do your quiz um, and if you have any questions about anything that we've covered up to now please let me know uh, and it will be test time soon in actually two lectures thanks very much for watching everyone appreciate it have yourself a good one